Okay, let's start. I hope you had a good lunch. Now ready to dive a little bit into engineering. I'm happy to introduce my colleague, Deepak, who is the maintainer of open source networking components that we built upon, uh, on top of Mesos. Maybe you've heard Spartan, Minuteman, Navstar. And he's going to talk about the networking stack, DCOS networking stack. Deepak, Thank your you. time. Thank you, Alex. Welcome, everybody. So to begin with, to, Alex has given some introduction to who I am. I'm Deepak, who's uh, basically a technical lead at Mesosphere, maintaining the open source project that Alex just mentioned, which includes service discovery components and load balancing components. And today's talk is primarily focusing on these components and how they work together to build container networking in DCOS. So microservices has really emerged as a modern day architecture for applications. The reason being they are flexible because you can divide your monolithic application into simpler components and you can design, develop, and deploy these components independently. Also they are scalable because you can independently decide which component you want to run multiple instances. But the scalability and flexibility comes at a cost of deployment complexity. Imagine that you have these components and their dependencies. And if these components happen to run on same host, then the dependency might conflict with each other. Well, the answer is run everything in containers. Containers is this nice concept where you pack your dependency as well as component and run them together in an isolation, such that even if two containers happen to run on the same host, the dependency of the component won't conflict with each other. But I'm sure those who have played enough with containers would understand that containers themselves are not enough. One, these containers are transient. They are mortal, so they die or they could die. And then you need a system which could continuously monitor these containers and can launch them in your cluster. Each container consumes a certain amount of system resources, like CPU, memory, and disk. You need some sort of resource management for your containers in a cluster. And finally, the services that are running within these containers needs to be able to talk and discover each other. And so you need some sort of a mechanism that can do service management for these containers in your cluster. And this is where DCOS comes in. DCOS is this container orchestration platform which has Mesos at its heart. And it, along with its framework, supports container scheduling and resource management. It also do service discovery through, through service discovery mechanism and load balancing. And we will see in today's talk how this is done in TCOS. But before that, before we actually look into specific DCOS stack, I wanted you to understand what are the complexities or challenges in providing container networking. So let's say you have this DCOS container orchestration platform running a bunch of containers. The very first challenge is to provide IP connectivity among these containers. And the reason this is a challenge is because these containers have different modes of operations. They could be running on the host mode, just like a host, or any application on the host. Or they could be sitting deep inside a VM, which again could be running on a host. So it's like multi-layer uh, uh, deployment, right? Once you resolve the IP connectivity, the next challenge is to provide service discovery mechanism. Like I was saying earlier, the services that are running in these containers needs to be able to talk to each other. And as these containers are transient, they can be continuously be dying and getting rescheduled on a different host. So your service discovery mechanism should be efficient enough to update the service records in a timely manner. And Finally, you would want multiple instances of these containers to be running behind a load balancer. 
And load balancer also pretty much share the same challenge as service discovery. It needs to reflect the changes that are happening in the cluster in a timely manner. This brings us to our today's talk. We'll be touching, uh, or I'll be giving a, a detailed overview of what is CNI, Container Networking Interface. Then we'll go and see how service discovery is done in DCOS networking stack. And finally, the load balancing. But before we dive deep into each of these components, let's see how the overall picture looks like and how these components fit in together to complete the container networking in DCOS. So let's say that you have a master with a bunch of agent nodes. You can either use Docker runtime to launch Docker containers, or you can use something called universal container runtime, Mesos runtime, to, to launch both Mesos containers or Docker containers. Now, UCR has a native support for CNI, which is Container Networking Interface. And we'll be seeing uh, what it is in follow-up slides. But UCR uh, CNI is the specification which makes it really easy for any third-party network provider to write a plugin against that specification. And then it, it automatically works with Mesos. So that takes, and that's why you see that there are so many net working third-party network providers um, that provides the IP connectivity. So they take care of connecting the containers and providing a flat network. Docker, on the other hand, use something called container network model, which is kind of similar to CNI, but it's not a, like a standard. It's their own homegrown thing, but it works similarly. Now, the service discovery part is done by a component called Spartan and Mesos DNS. Spartan is is a component that runs on all the nodes, including masters, in a distributed fashion. And we'll see what benefit it gives us being distributed. And then they gossip around to get the cluster um, information. Similarly, load balancing is provided by a component called Minuteman. It is also like Spartan fully distributed and runs on each node. And then they gossip around to get the cluster global view. So just keep this picture in mind while we are discussing each of these uh, components separately to just give you a context as how these components fit in the entire picture. Starting with the container networking interface. So this is something proposed by CoreOS, and now it's um, adopted by CNCF body. So as I was saying earlier, UCR has a native support for this. So the way it works is there is an um, isolator in in Mesos, which is, um, uh, which is a network CNI isolator. It's responsible for creating the network namespace for a particular container. And then this namespace, it invokes a CNI plugin, which is sitting on each agent at a predefined location. And it gives this container namespace or the network namespace to that plugin. The plugin does the actual work of connecting the network namespace of the container to the host and provides the connectivity that way. To give you a specific example, so each CNI or each virtual network in DCOS comes with a configuration file. And this configuration files pretty much define the name of the virtual network, which is an important field. And the second important field is the type of plugin. So there are different plugins depending on the functionality they provide. Like you have a bridge plugin, you have an IPAM plugin, which is responsible for IP addresses. You have IP VLAN plugin, MAC VLAN plugins, and many more. So the type defines what type of plugin you would be using for this configuration. And the name defines a virtual network. And we will see why this name is so important. So this configuration sits on each agent at a predefined location. Now let's say there is a task um, that is being launched on this agent. The way this particular virtual network is used or the way this particular task get assigned to this network is through the name. So if you see the name field um, is Mesos net, which is, which, matching, which is matching to the CNI configuration. Now let's say this task is getting launched on this agent. The agent, the CNI isolator running in the agent will create the network namespace for the container. And then it will hand over this namespace to, to bridge plugin. 
The reason it is bridge plugin is because the type in the configuration is bridge for this particular example. And so bridge plugin will take this network namespace and connect the container to, to the host networking or whatever logic it has built. This is how the, the container networking interface in general work. Now, one specific implementation of this CNI is present in DCUS in the form of overlay networks. Why we need overlay network is there is this requirement that sometimes you want to give IP to a container. Usually, the IP addresses that you give to a container are non-routable. Um, like if you're launching a container in a bridge mode, then that IP is not routable on the host network. But you could create something called overlay on the host. The reason why it is called overlay is because the host network is considered as underlay, and you're kind of doing an encapsulation on top of that. So say you have two agents and running two containers. The container has its own IP address, which is in a subnet, which is different from the host IP address. So then if container 1 wants to talk to container 2, the way it happens is container 1 will will form a packet with the destination of container 2's IP address. It will send that to something called a VTAP interface, which is running in the host. VTAP interface will create this encapsulation and send it to a neighboring VTAP. And neighboring VTAP will decapsulate this packet and send it to the container 2. So that's why this IP per container is achieved through an overlay. Now. The, the reason why I said that this is a particular CNI configuration, because it uses um, a bridge CNI plugin for connectivity. You, if you see the previous picture, there's a bridge involved. So this bridge is coming from the bridge CNI plugin. And then it uses something called VXLAN, which is out of shelf um, encapsulation algorithm in Linux kernels. Um, the way you could use an overlay network is through a config.yaml. I'm sure those who have played enough with DCUS would have encountered this config.yaml. It is basically a JSON file with the initial configuration of your cluster. So you can define your overlay um, for your cluster. So this is the, the, the configuration that you see on the screen is the default configuration. It comes out of box. But you could, or you could change this configuration, either the, the subnet, or you could add new overlays. Each overlay is defined by a particular subnet. In this case, the subnet is 9 slash 8 subnet. You could have your own overlay with a different subnet. To give you a high level view of how the request or how this overlay is set up in, in DCOS, it's, let's say that there is, a, there is an agent module that is running on each agent as well as on the master. When agent comes, when this overlay module comes for the first time, it registers to the master. At the time of registration, master will take the, the whole subnet and slice it down into equal chunks and give this one chunks to the agent. That's how agent gets the IP address. So the partition of the subnet for overlay is very static. Right? Then there is a utility called NEFSAR that is running on each agent that pulls the local uh, module, the overlay module. So when the model, uh, local model gets the subnet from the master, uh, this utility picks up that subnet and configures routes appropriately into the, into the host kernel. It also gossips this information to rest of the uh, NEFSA that are running on other agents. And that's how they build a complete mesh of network so that each agent knows what are the subnets the neighboring agent is holding and how to reach there. So when a task is launched by a framework, say Marathon, and the task now has a routable IP address because the routes are already configured by Nefstar. So that was about the, about the IP connectivity. Now coming to, to service discovery. Service discovery in DCOS is done through two components. One is Spartan, and one is mes another is Mesos DNS. For each task or service that is launched on DCS cluster, there is a, there are certain amount, certain DNS records that are created. There are A records that are created by both Spartan and Mesos, and also the SRV records. Now, to give you a high level view how, how they interact with the system or how they create these service records, so both Mesos DNS and Spartan that are running on the master pulls the state.json, that is the state that is exposed by Mesos. 
and then Spartan gets this information, creates the record, necessary records, that is ANSRB record, and gossip this information to the rest of the cluster. So there's a Spartan, as I was saying earlier, there's a Spartan running on each agent, and they gossip to get the complete view of the cluster. Now, when, when the actual task get launched on a particular agent, and it queries for any DNS record, that query is intercepted locally by that local Spartan. And thus response and respond to that uh, container or the service. So literally, the DNS, if it is internal to the cluster, it never leaves the agent. And that's one of the benefit of having Spartan distributed and running on each node. So Spartan is this DNS proxy that intercept all the DNS queries that are coming from the services that are running on that particular host. Along with being distributed, it also has another functionality called dual dispatch. Usually, the way DNS works is if you have a couple of name servers, then the DNS query will go to the first name server. And for some reason, if it is not responding, it will wait for the timeout to happen. And then the second DNS, it will reach to the second DNS name server. The, what Spartan does, it simultaneously send queries to both the name server so that we don't waste time in waiting for one name server to respond. And whoever responds first, Spartan takes that re query response and send it to the client. So that gives a little bit of um, speed up in DNS resolution. Beside that, Spartan has this ability to have uh, authoritative, you can configure a domain, and you can configure an upstream for a domain. Like for example, if you have an upstream that can only handle .com as the TLD, then you could configure multiple upstreams for different TLDs. The way dual dispatch works is when there's a query from any agent, then Spartan inserts that query, but it sends that query to two upstream name servers simultaneously. And whoever responds first, it takes that response, send it to the agent, and then it also stores the metric for future. So it, it remembers which name server responded first, so that in the next query, it can choose that name server as compared to the slower one. So if there is a task that is running on an agent, it, most of the time, the, the DNSs are local to the cluster. So the DNS resolution happens local to that agent. But if it is something like external, which is like kind of .com, then it goes to the upstream, which is configured for Spartan. Or if it is .mesos, then it goes to the mesos DNS running on the master. So that was about service discovery through DNS. Coming to load balancing part. So load balancing is done at two different layer and two by two different components. So at layer four, it's also the east-west load balancing within the cluster. Um, and it is done by Minuteman. The layer seven load balancing is done through a component called Marathon LB, which is a wrapper around HA proxy. So we'll see both of them today. Minuteman, Minuteman uses um, something called uh, IPVS load balancer, which is in Linux kernel. So it programs the IPVS entry into the Linux kernel, and they are on, so the control plane is done by the Minuteman, but the data plane is entirely in kernel. Oh, full load balancing is happening in, in the kernel itself. And the algorithm that we use today is weighted least connection, but the weight is one for all the connections, so it's pretty much the least connection. The way you use WIP in DCOS is, is through app definition. When you launch an app through Marathon, you need to provide a, this JSON file which contains your uh, configuration for the app. And in that, you could specify a label saying WIP, which with the WIP name. The actual WIP that the whole, the fu fully qualified DNS that is generated is, is the bottom of the screen, which is webserver.marathon.l4lb this DCUS dot directory. The reason the name is so big, because we wanted to uh, have an ability for multiple frameworks to have same app with the same name. For example, web server could be with some other framework. So the, the way the DNS is expanded is there's a service name, dot framework name, then dot L4LB, this DCUS and directory. Uh, at a high level, let's say there is a task that is launched by Marathon on a particular uh, agent. So it will convey that 
information to the master. Master will select one of the agent based on the resources. And so the agent is, so let's say the agent selected by master is agent one. And the label that you're seeing foo colon 5000 is the actual web. But the task, so the web, web port is different from the actual port on which the task is running. In this particular case, it is, let's say, it's 6789. Minuteman, which is running on agent one, locally polls the state of Mesos on that particular agent. And that's how it learns that there is a task launched by a web. What it does, it gossips this information to all the Minutemen so that they can also create um, a record, the, and they can also program their IPVS entries. So each Minuteman, when it gets this information that there is a task launched by a launch whip and it needs a load balancing, it takes that and assign an IP address, which is local to that agent. And it also programs the kernel with, with that information. So the, so the whip IP is 1234 colon 500 colon 5000, and then the actual backend is the task X with the actual port. Now when task 2, say randomly, it wants to connect to task 1 through a web, it, it first queries the DNS for that web. The, the DNS is intercepted, the DNS query is intercepted by Spartan and responded back to this agent with the actual IP address, that is the web IP address, colon 5000. And then, when it when it tries to connect to that web, the IPVS entry that was created by Minuteman in the kernel intercept that connection request and forwards it to the actual task. That is x colon six seven eight nine. That's how the load balancing is working in in DCUS. Now coming to layer seven load balancing, which is done by Marathon LB. It, as I said earlier, it's a wrapper around uh, HA proxy. So it takes the configuration, basically it hooks itself to the Marathon event bus. So as soon as there's an application that is launched by Marathon, it gets the event, um, and then it programs the HA proxy accordingly. So, as, so if a client connects to Marathon LB, Marathon LB already watching for, for the tasks that are launched by Marathon, it configures the HA proxy for those tasks, and then um, when the client actually connects, it load balance them for these tasks. The way you use uh, Marathon LB, or the way you instruct Marathon LB for any particular task is again through the app definition in Marathon, and, the, and you have to specify labels, those there are like a bunch of labels for different configurations, so everything that an HA proxy can be configured with is, there is a corresponding label for that. So in this case, there are two labels that I'm showing. One is the external, which says that the configuration that you're creating is for the external client. And the second is, second is the vhost. This is the DNS at which the external client would be connecting. Right? Um, and this is something that we are working on currently and should have um, support in future. So we are working on something called IPv6 support. So far, our DCS network stack is only IPv4, but going forward, it will support both IPv4 and IPv6. Then we are working on something called CNI spec version 0.3, which introduces um, uh, a nice concept called uh, service chaining. So imagine that uh, you want different services to use from different CNI provider. Today, you cannot really mix and match those CNI providers into a single virtual network. But with service chaining, you would be able to do that. And then um, a support of multi-tenancy. Today, any operator can use any virtual network to launch their container. We want to make it more secure in such a way that an operator should be able to define rules and only certain users or operator can launch containers or certain networks and should be forbidden to launch container on others. So this is something we are working on building. 
and finally the, the, the stack that we started with. So this concludes my talk today. And I open the floor for question and answer. Thanks, Deepak. For questions, we have a microphone here. Do we have questions? One question there. Uh, hi, thank you. So uh, I have a question uh, specifically to the DCOS Spartan component. Mm -hmm. You are saying that you can uh, configure it to use the dual dispatch mode. So uh, in that particular case, I'm interested if you are limited to the number of upstream DNS resolvers that you can configure. Because as far as I know, it ca it ca the dual dispatch is made to two separate master nodes, right? So what happens if I accidentally, or if I configure three upstream resolvers and it selects just the two ones that don't resolve that particular re record that I'm looking for? So am, am I limited to just two in this case? So that's a good question. So let's say you have multiple upstream that you have configured. Yeah, it will randomly select two. Each time when it does the selection, it does it randomly. So let's say if, if two it selected, uh, unfortunately, both of them are not responding. Then it will remember the next time when it selects, then it will give lower weightage to these two, and it will select the third one. So over time, it will learn that there is an upstream that always responds, and it will always include that upstream in the dual dispatch. But yes, initially, if your upstreams are not responding, then at least one, two trial will it, it will take to, to get that information that your upstreams are not responding back. OK, thank you. Other questions? Uh, I'm wondering if you are uh, considering switching from IPFS uh, to eBPF in uh, Minuteman. Are you considering this solution? IPVS2? Uh, IPVS to eBPF, because... Uh, yes. So we want to. The only challenge there is that eBPF requires certain minimum amount of, a minimum version of kernel, like Linux kernel. I think it is 4. 4. plus something. But many of our customers are running really old kernel. So there we do not have support for eBPF. But we are moving, like we want to provide this support for the uh, kernels that are already there, so customers should be free, like in future, they will be free to choose whether they want to use IPVS or eBPF, depending on the support in the kernel. OK, thank you. Other questions? comes to Marathon LB, uh, when you have a syntactic error in the labels, uh, the HA proxy won't restart, and so the cluster isn't reachable anymore. Uh, so are there any plans to uh, work on this? Sorry, I didn't catch the question there. Uh, when, uh, essentially, when you deploy a container with a label that has a syntactical error, okay. and so HA proxy won't restart. Right. Oh, uh, your your whole cluster isn't reachable anymore. Are there any plans to work around this? I guess not. Like you need to um, fix that problem. <laughs> right, but you see the impact. One developer sets a label and a whole cluster for. So you need. You're saying, is there a way the validation can happen before everything goes right, down? Yeah. Right. Such like a dummy restart or something like that. Yeah. I mean, that's a good point. Today, we don't do any validation, um, at least on the app definition level. We could, we could think about adding that. Or that MLB is like an open source project. If you have something in mind, you could also contribute to that. I think there's a pull request for that issue pending since mm, a few months. OK. <laughs> I think we can also write a Grammarly plugin. Every second time I watch a YouTube video, it recommends me to use Grammarly. Maybe it will help you in this case. Other questions? One in front.
Um, hi, I have a purely, almost theoretical question. So what if I do not want to use IP per container? Mm -hmm. um, what if I, w can I use the network isolator without that? And let's say that I'm in high performance trading where the distance between the router and the rack actually matters. Mm -hmm. And I want to bind the container to, the n to a network card. How does CNI help me there? Mm -hmm. And also, what is the performance hit when I use uh, one of the, well, for example, the proposed um, bridge overlay network? Right, OK. So there are a couple of questions. Um, the, the first uh, question is whether CNI network will help you to connect to a particular network card, right? Yes. The answer is yes. Actually, the way CNI works is it, the logic of how the network has to be done is in the plugin itself. So as long as plugin has a particular logic as how it want to lay out the network, it will work with Mesos and DCUS. Because uh, as I was saying, the isolator, the network isolator is simply creating the network namespace and handing over this namespace to CNI plugin. Now it's up to the plugin how it wants to connect. So it can pick up a particular network card and connects your container to that. Now coming to second question, what is the performance hit of using bridge mode or overlay mode? So, so both bridge, so from the technical point of view, we need to understand where the performance hit might come. The in, in, in networking world, the performance hit always happens if you have to copy the packet, the actual packet. Usually why these switches and routers work blazingly fast is because they always work on headers. They never pull the entire packet in memory. But if you have to pull the entire packet in memory because you are doing some sort of a NAT or you are doing some sort of encapsulation, then you will have a performance hit. And usually the performance hit is like 40%. Uh, be just mail, mainly because of the fact that you you are taking the entire packet and encapsulating into another packet. That's with overlay. With bridge, the Linux bridge implementation has improved quite a bit, but it still has a hit, again, because of the copying of the packet. Now, there are implementation, like there is, there is this fast bridge um, in OVN, which which has um, removed some of these performance hit, so you could use that for the performance improvement. But as long as you are using Linux bridge, native Linux implementation, or the overlay, you'll have a performance hit. Does this answer all the questions? Do we have other questions? Then All right. I think we can thank Deepak with an applause. Thank you.